following is an EWTN special presentation. As you can see in the program for our 2017 conference, I gave an interesting t title to my presentation. You can see it over there. Such as we are, such are the times. Uh, uh, option for Christian living in a post-Christian America. So you may be thinking, what is the Archbishop going to talk about? <laughs> well, I'm the Archbishop of Los Angeles. Hollywood is over there. So watch out. Am I going to talk about politics or sports or maybe the end of the world? That would be interesting, no? So you will discover later on on my presentation why I decided to give that title to the talk. Obviously, I was following the general topic of the conference about the reality of living in a post-Christian culture. But then, I had the blessing just a few weeks ago to lead our first uh, Archdiocese of Los Angeles pilgrimage to the Basilica of Our Lady Guadalupe in Mexico City. It was a beautiful time. Then everything made sense to me. And hopefully, I can share with you my joyful rediscovery at the contemplation of the image of Our Lady Guadalupe of who we are and what are the times that we are called to live and sanctify. I think most of us know the Guadalupe story. I'm sure that you all do. It takes us back to the spiritual dawn of the church's mission in the Americas. I have personal uh, devotion to Our Lady Guadalupe since I was a little boy because uh, with my parents, we went, and my sisters, we went every year to, the, uh, to Mexico City, and we have a pilgrimage to Our Lady Guadalupe, just our family. Do you know the story? It was December 1531, and the Blessed Virgin appeared to a poor Indian convert named Juan Diego on a hilltop outside of Mexico City. And the Virgin Mary entrusted Juan Diego with a mission to go and ask the bishop to build a shrine in her name. And as we remember, to convince the bishop, Our Lady gave him a sign. She made roses bloom even though it was the dead of winter. Then she used those roses to imprint her own image on the cloak, what we call the tilma, that Juan Diego was wearing. And as we know, that tilma is still hang it today, almost five, uh, ye 500 years later in the Basilica, which is built not far from the site where she first appeared. And I'm remembering this story because I believe that Guadalupe holds the key for understanding the times we are living in. So that's what I want to talk to you about. Uh, today. Also, it really makes sense because the Napa Institute, as we know, is entrusted to Our Lady Guadalupe. So I want to offer my reflections today on the important conversation that has been going on in the church this year. The question of how we are going to live our Catholic faith and carry out the church's mission in a post-Christian society. A society that uh, every day is becoming more and more hostile to our values and our beliefs. It is a crucial conversation. And as we heard this morning from Archbishop Chapu, and we have seen in his book, he's right. We are fast becoming strangers in a strange land. His recent book is the most important book that has been written in the church in some time. And I agree with him. It is not a matter of indifference whether we choose one path 
or going forward, or another going forward. So I'm going to offer my reflections in three parts. Hopefully, you can stay awake at least for one part. <laughs> First, I want to begin by looking at the cultural moment we find ourselves in, the signs of the times. Second, I'm going to suggest that we need to see our personal situation in light of the event of Guadalupe. I believe that in this event, we can see God's vision, his plans and purposes for the church in the Americas. And third and finally, I want to offer some hopefully brief reflections on some themes that we discovered in the story of Guadalupe. These themes provide us with a way forward, a way to think about our Christian lives and mission in the years ahead. So with that introduction, let me begin. I think all of us here today feel a sense of urgency about where our country is heading. Back in the first centuries of the church, St. Jerome was writing about the Arian heresy, which denied that Jesus Christ was truly God. And Jerome had that famous line, the whole world woke up and groaned and was astonished to find that it was Arian. We could, say, we could say something similar about our times. In the last decade, it is like we all woke up to discover that American society is being progressively de-Christianized. Our beliefs, beliefs are now labeled as a kind of hatred or intolerance. Our church institutions face lawsuits for the crime of still believing what Jesus taught. The crime of no one wanting to cooperate with practices we find immoral or dehumanizing. My dear friends, we do not have the luxury to choose the times we live in. These are our times. There is no denying it. But the saints remind us that all times in the church are dangerous times. St. Augustine said, bad times, troublesome times. This is what people are saying. Let our lives be good, he said, and the times will be good. We make our times such as we are, such are the times. Now you know where, where I got the title for my presentation. <laughs> Not bad, San Agustin. Such as we are, such are the times. This is the challenge that Christians face in every time and every place. So the question for us is, are we going to shape our times or are we allow our times to shape us? What we decide will make all the difference, not only for ourselves and our families, but also for our times, for our society and culture. And that brings me back to Guadalupe. For me, the question is not really, how are we going to shape our times? The better question is, how does God want us to shape our times? What is the path that Jesus Christ will have to follow in this moment, will have us to follow in this moment in our nation's history? And I want to suggest that the path already exists. It began in Guadalupe in 1531. The apparition of Our Lady Guadalupe was not a random occurrence. There are no coincidences in the, provinces of, in the providence of God. Our Lady did not appear only for the Mexican people. Her intentions were continental and universal. In the account that has been handed down to us, and I come based on the testimony of Saint Juan Diego, Our Lady told him, I am truly your compassionate mother, your mother, and the mother to all who dwell in this land and to all other nations and peoples. Our Lady Guadalupe, the mother of God came to be the mother of the Americas. 
Guadalupe is f the true founding event in American history. And that means it is, it is a true founding event in the history of our country and in the history of all other countries in North and South America. We are all children of Guadalupe, of Our Lady of Guadalupe, our Blessed Mother. Guadalupe gives us the real story of America. In God's plan, this is one continent. It is meant to begin a new civilization, a new world of faith. This is what Guadalupe is all about. As you know, within a few years after this apparition, millions came to be baptized in Mexico and throughout the Americas. A great wave of holiness swept through the continent, raising up saints and heroes of the faith in every country. In a sense, Mexico City, the uh, hill of Tepeyac, became the spiritual headquarters, mission control for the evangelization of the Americans, Asia, and Oceania. When Saint Junipero Serra, the apostle of California, came to the New World, he set sail aboard a ship called Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe. And guess what he did when he first came to Veracruz, Mexico? He immediately started walking 300 miles to the shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico City because he wanted to entrust his mission to Our Lady of Guadalupe. When he got there, he spent the night in prayer, and in the morning, he celebrated Mass and consecrated his American mission to the Virgin Mary. My dear friends, we need to follow his example. We need to consecrate our Christian lives and the Church's mission to our Blessed Mother. I think this is the answer to the challenges we face right now in our culture. The way for forward for our church right now, in this moment, the way forward for the church is to return to Guadalupe. We need to follow the path that the Virgin Mary sets before us, the path to building a new civilization of love and truth in the Americas. It is a beautiful vision. You think about St. Junipero Serra coming to Mexico, then walking all the way to California and facing the challenges that he was facing. Every time that I come here or any part of the state of California, I immediately start thinking, you know, how, how was this state uh, in, 17, in the 1770s when Junipero Serra came? There was no Hollywood, no Napa Valley. And here we are, thanks to him. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that the way we are called to live our lives now in this challenging situation? So this is the path to building a new civilization of love and truth in the Americas. So in the reminder of the time that we have together, again, uh, hopefully enough for too long, I want to offer a brief ref reflection, kind of a spiritual interpretation of the Guadalupe story in light of our moment here in our country. That, to be honest with you, uh, as I was thinking of coming uh, to the Napa Institute Conference, and I was in Mexico City, uh, in that beautiful shrine, I was thinking of what, what I would say and how we are supposed to uh, go ahead in our beautiful mission to bring back this civilization and truth and love to our country. So I started thinking, what are the things that are there in the apparition of Our Lady of Guadalupe the things that she was saying to St. Juan Diego that can help us. So I came up with, with five things. Vocation, education, life, culture, and family. It's what we are talking about here, no doubt about it. We were just talking about uh, the culture of life, students for life. This morning we had beautiful presentations about what is it that we are called to do in a society that is becoming more and more post-Christian. So the first one, vocation. At the heart of the Guadalupe event is a story about a personal vocation and mission. Our Lady Guadalupe entrusted Saint Juan Diego with a task to build a shrine in her name. She wanted this shrine, and I quote, to show, to show praise, and testify to God. She wanted this shrine to be a place where people will find God's love, compassion, help, 
comfort, and salvation. Isn't this just a beautiful summary of the mission of the church and the purpose of our, our Christian lives? God is calling us to build a shrine with our lives. Through our work and the way we live, God is calling us to bear witness to his salvation, to the difference that Jesus Christ, Christ makes in our lives. He's calling us to show his love and compassion to our brothers and sisters. And my dear friends, God is speaking those words to you and to me at this time. God has a message that he wants you to deliver with your lives. And each one of us, we all need to rediscover the beautiful truth that every one of us has a vocation to be holy, to be a saint, to build a shrine with our lives. Because as we know, holiness does not mean separation from the world. Holiness means transforming the world living totally for the love of God and sanctifying the world by our love and service. This is the first lesson of Guadalupe, our personal vocation. Then education. The sec for me, the second lesson of Guadalupe, as I was meditating on what is it that we need in our country at this time, we really need to teach the knowledge and love of Jesus Christ. Saint Juan Diego was on his way to church when he met Our Lady. It was his custom. Every Saturday and Sunday, he uh, got up before dawn, and he walked nine miles from his home to go to Mass, and then go to classes to keep deepening his knowledge of the Catholic faith. That's a good challenge for us, no? Walk nine miles every morning. We don't need any more diets, eh? For Juan Diego, Jesus Christ came into his life and everything changed. There is nothing more beautiful as we know than to know Jesus Christ. This is the message for the church in our times. We are here to share this beautiful treasure of our relationship with the living God who became a man for us, who gave his life to save us and to make us into a new humanity, who is living with us now and walking with us as our friend, our best friend. So when we teach, we are calling people to conversion, which means a new way of thinking and looking at the world. Our faith is not just a collection of rules and obligations. The Catholic faith is a way of living, a way of seeing the world with new eyes, with the eyes of Jesus. We need to renew in our times the Catholic imagination and our sacramental vision. We need to push back against the scientific and materialistic vision of our age. We are living in a culture, as we know, that tell, tells us that there is no reality that transcends what we can see and hear and taste and touch. What is that? That is a world without God without the possibility of God. But we know that the incarnation of Jesus changes everything. The things of nature and ordinary life are transfigured. The visible world is now a sacrament of invisible realities and beauty. Everything in this world can now be a sign and a pathway that brings us into the presence of God. The most simple thing that we can think of, when we understand that God is present with us, he wants to be with us, changes immediately. And we see the beauty of that simple little thing. Uh, I'll give you an example, also from St. Juan Diego. In the presence of the Virgin Mary, Juan Diego wondered whether he was in paradise, whether heaven had come to earth. With her coming, with the, the apparition of our Blessed Mother, the mountains were filled with songs like wonderful birds. That's what the, the account of the apparition tells. Flowers bloom in the winter season in Seoul where there were only stones and cactus and turns. This is the beauty that we can see with the eyes of faith. So in our teaching, 
As we share with others the beauty of our faith, we need to help people to see that our lives are connected, are part of the beautiful mystery of God's plan of creation. A great adventure that is unfolding under the eyes of our loving Father. Vocation, education, life. Our Lady Guadalupe appeared as an icon of new life, as a woman carrying a child. She presented herself to Juan Diego as the mother of all the living. She told him, I quote, I am the ever virgin, Holy Mary, mother of the true God, the life-giving creator of all peoples. Guadalupe is a vision of the world as God wants it to be. The shrine that Our Lady wants us to build in the Americas is a new civilization, a culture that celebrates life and welcomes life. And as we know, the Christian faith in this new world confronted the brutality of the Aztec rituals of human sacrifice. From the beginning, the saints and missionaries of the Americas proclaim that every life is precious and an image of the living God. And we need to continue this mission. And as we see every day in our society, the challenge is that life has become cheap and easily discarded. We see it in the crisis of homelessness, in the lives wasted by addiction. We see it in the push to spread euthanasia and the continued tragedy of abortion. So this is a task for us, my dear brothers and sisters. The saints of the Americas teach us to go to the peripheries and margins of our society, to care for those who have no one to care for them. They teach us to meet others as brothers and as sisters, and to serve them from the heart of a personal sacrifice they teach us to defend the weak and the vulnerable. It is a beautiful call, a challenging call. And that's what uh, especially Pope Francis is talking about in the joy of the gospel. That's the joy of the gospel, going out, reaching out to people, sharing with them the beauty of God's love and presence in our personal lives. So, vocation, education, life, culture. When lo we look at the self-image that, that Our Lady left imprinted on the tilma, we immediately notice that she's a brown-skinned young woman, a mestizo, a person whose family background includes a mix of descendants from Europe and the indigenous peoples. She came dressed in the garments of the indigenous peoples and spoke to Juan Diego in his own indigenous language. And in all this, our Blessed Mother reveals herself in a powerful way to be an icon of the church. Our Lady Guadalupe reminds us that the church was established to be the vanguard of our new humanity and a new civilization, one family of God drawn from every race and every nation and every language. Right now, Again, as we all know, in our country, and even in the church, we see signs that we still have problems with nativism and racial discrimination. So we need to pray, and we need to work harder to overcome our divisions. Again, the saints of the America show us that holiness knows no color. Beyond the color of our skin or the, or the countries we, where we come from, we are all brothers and sisters, all children, of the one father, and the mother of God is our mother. This is the message of Guadalupe. And finally, family. The vision of Guadalupe, as you can see, as I was uh, praying before the beautiful image of Our Lady Guadalupe, I was thinking, and I came up with some of, some of these ideas. So I hope that they are useful for you all. Family. The vision of Guadalupe encourages us to strengthen marriage and the family as the foundations of a truly human civilization. Juan Diego was baptized together with his wife, Maria Lucia, in 1524. They were among the first converts in the New World and were one of the first Catholic married couples in the Americas. Sadly, she died five years later two years before 
Juan Diego's encounter with Our Lady. Our Lady Guadalupe came among us as the mother of the family of God in the Americas. And some of the earliest martyrs in this country, in our country, where missionaries were killed for their witness to God's truth about the meaning of marriage and the family. These include the uh, Hispanic Franciscus Martin in Georgia in 1597, and some of the martyrs of Florida. We need to ask these martyrs to give us the strength we need to confront the broad culture crisis of the family today. And Archbishop Chapu was talking to us about that this morning. And we do this, first, by living, as Archbishop Chapu was telling us, the beauty and fullness of churches teaching ourselves in our marriages and families. We need to be models of a culture that is confused. We need to proclaim by our example and more than our words, the beautiful truth about the human person and God's loving fault for creation and the family. It's not easy. It's a big challenge, as we were uh, uh, hearing this morning from Archbishop Chapu. It's true. It's a challenge. It's a beautiful challenge, but we can do it in our own families, uh, uh, in many ways, just in the simplicity of being together. I had the blessing just a few weeks ago to be with uh, some, uh, some members of my family. And it was a challenge because we had to all to travel to be together. No? And then to be together with your family for a long time is a challenge for somebody that's not used to it. And they are wonderful. I have four sisters and uh, 16 nieces and nephews. And, and not everybody was able to make it. And my nieces and nephews are all married that have, I don't know, hundreds of kids. I don't know. I'm exaggerating. But it's beautiful, but it takes an effort. In the same way, just to do it in our daily life, in our reality of our own families, it's just a beautiful blessing. I was very happy that I was able to spend some time with my family uh, this summer. We had a beautiful example of saints in, uh, in, in, uh, in the Americas. Like the servants of God, Eugenio Balmori Martinez and Marina Francisca Cinta Sarenlawe. They were from Veracruz, Mexico. And the story of their courtship is very moving. They wrote each other beautiful poems and love letters. And they gave us a beautiful vision of the family. Marina wrote, and I quote, our home will be a chapel of love, where no other ideal will reign other than to thank God and to love each other very much. There is beauty like this to be found everywhere in our families, in our parishes, in the joy of our children. We need to proclaim this to our culture. So let me try to finish drawing some conclusions. The great Saint Paul II called the image of Our Lady Guadalupe the Marian heart of America. Sometimes we forget this, for Guadalupe was the first place John Paul visited outside of Italy after he became Pope. St. John Paul understood that the mission of meaning of America is continental, universal. As we probably remember, he published a beautiful uh, document on Ecclesia in America, talking about the church in the whole continent. The nations of the Americans all trace their faith to the coming of the Virgin at Guadalupe. We share a common story of origins and we are joined in a common destiny. So my simple point today is that each one of us is a part of that story, part of that great mission to America that began with the visitation of the Virgin of Guadalupe. The church in this country and every one of us has the responsibility to continue the tasks that the Virgin gave to St. Juan Diego, to build a shrine with our lives to build a society that glorifies God and is worthy of the dignity of the human person. What Our Lady Guadalupe say, said to St. Juan Diego, she now says to us, you are my ambassadors, most worthy of my trust. So let me conclude by sharing an experience I had on my recent pilgrimage. 
As I said to you uh, when I was a kid, I used to go to Mexico City uh, for a visit to the Basilica. And it, is, it was this time very deeply moving for me to now be a priest and a bishop. As a matter of fact, I entrusted my ministry as a bishop to Our Lady Guadalupe. And uh, so far, it's, it's going fine. <laughs> <laughs> She's just making it a little more challenging every time. <laughs> so pray for me. Uh, but just saying mass in that beautiful basilica and that uh, altar. The altar, as you probably have seen it, sits directly underneath the miraculous image of the Virgin Mary. And when you are there, you can really feel the warmth of her tender eyes gazing down upon you. It's a powerful feeling, hard to describe. It's a beautiful sense of feeling protected, of feeling like a child who is loved by the mother of God. And when you are in her presence, you can almost hear her speaking the same tender words she spoke to St. Juan Diego. Do not let your heart be disturbed. Do not fear. Am I, your mother, not here? Are you not under my shadow and protection? Are you not in the folds of my arms? What more do you need? My dear friends, our mother is speaking these words to the church today, to each one of us. We need to lay our fears and hopes at the feet of the Virgin Mary, Our Lady of Guadalupe. We need to contemplate these times we are living, we are living in under the gaze of her loving eyes. We need to go always forward with confidence because we go with God and with his mother. Thank you very much. Your Grace, uh, thank you again for your courageous conversation about immigration. And I know the current administration has had some confusing issues about that, and it's, a, it's an opportunity to explain how important it is that Our Lady of Guadalupe, who we did consecrate this entire conference to her, and it's because she is the, the patroness of the Americas, but she also is leading us to an America's solution of immigration. And Archbishop Gomez has been talking about this for years. As a matter of fact, in 2011, at our first conference with 150 attendees, he spoke about immigration along with his predecessor, uh, Cardinal Mahoney. They were our first speakers on Thursday afternoon uh, in 2011. So he's back here now. And today, we would like to recognize him for his support of the Napa Institute when it's in its infancy by giving him the Father Robert Spitzer Award of Reason and Faith because the distinction of how Archbishop Gomez has approached this argument has been through reason and faith. He's explained how all of us were pilgrims, were immigrants, and how the Americas, and especially California, was built through immigration and Catholicism and how essential it is that he, a, a, a pilgrim and an immigrant, somebody was from Mexico but also lived in San Antonio, so he understands more than anybody both sides of this discussion. And, uh, but he's used reason and faith to drive the argument, not just battling out there and saying, you're wrong and I'm right, but writing books, talks, and he's continued to give us support. He just recently gave a talk in Washington, D.C. on this subject as well. So to Archbishop Gomez for his stellar commitment to a very important aspect of our uh, faith, immigration, uh, honoring the alien, as Tim Gray told us in the first um, uh, Napa Institute. So thank you.